That was no joke. We actually got hit by a micro EMP last night, otherwise known as a lightning strike. Now, lightning bolts can actually give off EMPs that can be measured on the opposite side of the world, depending on the strength of that lightning bolt. So we woke up at about six o'clock this morning and actually heard the sizzle of the uh, lightning bolt when it hit. And it sounded like it hit back behind the house, but we're not really sure at all. But either way, we do have an EMP shield on the house and it does protect against lightning strikes. And oddly enough, the whole house works perfectly fine. Our air conditioners are still running. We still have lights, but our well pump is dead. And so my only thought as to how this happened is because the well pump itself, what's down in the ground, has a wire that goes to a control box and then that control box goes to a breaker and then that breaker goes to the electrical panel. Um, I'm not exactly sure on the wiring and I'm waiting for an electrician to show up. I'm not an electrician. Um, I don't know exactly how that works, but for one reason or another, that lightning strike took out our well pump. Now, luckily, we've got a hand pump on our well and uh, luckily, the water is pretty high this year, so it's gonna be a little bit easier to pump the water out, but we still need to use the bathroom. And normally this is zero concern for me because I have so much solar set up. Uh, this is my current ground mount. We're about to go off grid actually. Um, but that's the difficulty of this situation is our well pump stopped working. And that's usually the thing I like the most is having water when we have these grid down situations, but only our well pumps down. So I'm gonna bring you along with me to show you uh, what we do here to get water when there is no power. This is one of the beauties of having the well is you get to do this as a backup. The not so fun part about it is when you actually have to use it. So I don't know how long it's gonna take me. This is a five gallon bucket. You could kind of measure how long it's gonna take me to get uh, five gallons out of here. Normally so our well pump goes like 150 or 180 feet down into the ground and then our well casing's about 200 feet into the ground. Uh, but the water table this year is really high. We had a really, really wet winter. Keep these buckets around for this exact reason. When you need a bucket, you need a bucket. And so we'll put a couple of these in each bathroom. Keep things simple for uh, getting toilets flushed. And if we want a shower, then we actually have a five gallon bucket water heater as a backup for having hot water. If we can't get hot water into the house. So... Who needs a rowing machine, right? When you got a well pump like this. So that's been one minute, probably about three and a half, four gallons. This is one of the reasons why we have a Berkey water filter. If this ever were the situation where we were unsure about the water we could get out of here, normally, I'm not concerned at all about this, but just because this hand pipe, hand pump hasn't been used in a while, there may be sediment that's built up in that casing. And then as well, the dirty buckets. Then we have the water filter. We pre-filter it to get out any large stuff. And then the Berkey takes care of everything else. And that should be basically five gallons. Took almost two minutes. So about two and a half gallons a minute. <laughs> and one of the things that I thought about doing is just taking this pump here. This one has 25 feet of head, which means it can pull up from 25 feet deep and actually just removed the top of the casing here, whatever this cap is called, and removed it. And I can see the water and it's probably about 20 feet deep. I didn't send down uh, a measuring tape. And that's just because with this hand pump in here, I don't know how deep the hand pump goes and the wiring that's in here, I don't think I'm actually gonna be able to fit a three quarter inch hose, which has a one inch outside all the way down. And so I think what I would prefer to do would be to get like a half inch hose and then get a three quarter inch adapter onto this, something that I could slip down and reach the water. But as it works with well pumps, as you draw the water out, the water level goes down because it takes time for the water in the ground to seep into the casing. And so that's my other concern is that this is gonna pump so much water that by the time that water goes from 20 feet to 25 feet of depth, that it's going to not be able to refill very fast. So just because of those complications, I'm not going to do that this time, but that is something I've looked at doing in the past is just using a portable pump like this. And then I've got solar generators, so plugging it in is no problem at all at any remote location. 
But that may be something to consider for your well pump is having a backup pump like this where you can just get to the water and pump it out. But for those reasons, because of its depth, I'm not going to do that. We're going to have someone here tomorrow to look at everything, see what's wrong. I'm sure it's just a capacitor issue, but we'll see. I've been wrong before. Oh, wow. I just broke that handle. And this just makes life a little bit easier. Move about 15 gallons at a time. I also have got a gorilla cart, which I can fit about four of these buckets in. Uh, normally, the whole family would be helping with this. Uh, my girls have helped pump a lot of this water, and my wife is at her hand-to-hand -hand combat training right now. And so she is not here, but luckily this isn't too bad, just moving all these buckets. So personally, I adhere to the 12 pillars of emergency preparedness, and the number one thing in those pillars is water. I'll keep a couple of buckets here. This is our guest bathroom that the kids use. Then obviously right after water is food. And then for me, right after food is security, which includes firearms. Because if this really were an EMP situation where everybody was knocked out, I would be a little bit more concerned about looting and groups of people getting together to get other people's stuff. And as part of that, it's one of the reasons why I've got my armor rack. I've got my weapon ready to go, got a uh, bump helmet as well as nods that I can throw on, fully plated armor, ammo, belt, got to throw a mags pistol on there, ready to go very quick. And then on my alternate rack, I have my direct action chest rig right here. This is already outfitted with smokes and navigation, IFAC, all sorts of things here. Ballistic helmet right here which has a very easy copyable setup to my other helmet. I've got a quick light I can throw on here, throw my nods on, counterweights. I can swap everything over very quickly to this helmet. I simply use my bump helmet a lot more than my ballistic helmet for obvious reasons, so I keep most of my stuff on there. And then there's power backup. This is absolutely one of the most underrated parts of preparedness. Everybody needs it, but people don't want to focus on it because it is a more expensive part of preparedness. I choose to go with solar and batteries for my backup because the sun shines very often and gasoline isn't always available. Now I do have dual, I have three dual fuel generators here at my house. So I have a backup to my backup to my backup for my backups. And I make sure that I have plenty of excess power, plenty of solar panels so I can run my entire house if needs be. As part of our food preparation, we do have rabbits. We can breed them up to three to four times a year, four times is a little aggressive, but they can technically go up to that many times a year. Each litter will have about five to eight rabbits. And then from there, you can perpetually keep breeding more and more, but you can easily get a couple hundred pounds of meat just from rabbits alone each year. We also keep ducks. Uh, one of the reasons is because I'm allergic to chicken eggs, but duck eggs happen to have one and a half times the amount of protein and nutrients to a chicken egg comparatively and we get about four to five duck eggs a day. So it's essentially getting the same as about six to eight chicken eggs every single day. If you recall at the beginning of the video, I did mention that we heard the actual sizzle of a lightning bolt hitting behind the house. And this is actually the fiberglass housing that typically would hold our 10 foot ham radio antenna. I don't know if it got struck by lightning directly because we have this 20 foot pole right here. It would make sense that it acted like a lightning rod, but there's a huge chunk there's about a five foot chunk here and about a five foot chunk here. And then there's fiberglass pieces like this all over the ground. And it literally exploded the entire ham radio antenna. So I'm going to have to make sure I replace this as well as have a backup one to make sure that if this were to happen again, that I can replace it. I also have trenched wire under the ground for my ham radio cable. And I'm gonna have to redo that as well. Just to give you a closer look, you can see it's hanging in the tree here at these two huge chunks. Now when it comes to EMP protection, I have an EMP shield on my main electrical panel in my house. But this is where I found the chink in my armor on how I was susceptible to being hit by this lightning strike EMP strike and why it caused a problem. So I have my main electrical panel and that means we have the grid coming in straight into the main electrical panel which then runs the whole house. But off of the main electrical panel, I have a sub panel. That sub panel is in our basement and the well pump is on the sub panel. The well is outside and has wires that go straight to the sub panel. And it's the first breaker in the electrical box. And it's the first breaker in that breaker panel. So it goes from the well pump up the casing and then through the ground 
and into the breaker, and then from the breaker goes to the control board, which is what turns the well pump on and off. So because the lightning bolt or the EMP wave that came off of the lightning bolt either hit the casing or hit the wires or hit the ground and it absorbed and went in through the house that way, that's where I found my weakness. So if you have a similar setup, make sure you get this protection as well. What I now need to do is my main electrical panel is protected from grid hits, but I'm not protected from a local hit because of that wire in the ground. So I have to actually get an EMP shield onto my sub panel to make sure I'm protecting the EMP wave coming in that way. Also, because of my ham radio antenna, if I had had that connected to my ham radio at the time, it would have absolutely taken out my ham radios as well. Luckily, I had them disconnected. So keep that in mind. If you've got big antennas out there, you probably don't want to keep your ham radio connected to it all the time. If you're not using it, probably want to disconnect it because that's going to allow the EMP strike to get into your radio and the ham radios are some of the most vital pieces of communication that you'll have after an EMP attack. For my things like my ham radios, I keep them in my Faraday bags. The Faraday bags are from techprotectbags.com. They're made to military standards. They've been tested for years and years and years, and they do stop EMPs. And so I keep my smaller electronics in those Tech Protect Faraday bags. I'll have links and coupons down below for the Tech Protect Faraday bags, as well as a coupon for the EMP shield. I keep an EMP shield on my house. I'm now going to add another one to my sub panel, so I protect that. And then I have them on my vehicles. You can get them for RVs. And I'm actually working to bring EMP shields for specific solar generators. That way everybody can enjoy the protection for these bigger systems, because these bigger systems don't fit inside Faraday bags. There's also some things coming to the market very soon that will work for having bigger components like these power stations to fit inside of a Faraday protection enclosure, but I can't give out details on that just yet. So make sure you're subscribed and you like the video because you're gonna to wanna to stay tuned for that. And if you wanna get complete solar backup systems, then go to poweredportablesolar.com. Again, I'll have the links down below. That's where you can get the most affordable as well as complete kits or just separate items of these solar generators or power stations to make sure you have enough backup power to run all of your needs. Everybody's needs are different, so for that reason, you may want to shoot me an email to info at poweredportablesolar.com. Let me know what your overall goal is, what your budget is, and or just a list of things that you want to be able to keep running long term after a power outage, whether it's a hurricane, EMP strike, whatever it is. As long as we have that list, we can get a really good idea of what system is going to work best. All in all, emergency preparedness is about being well-rounded. It's about being able to get water and filter it. It's about being able to have food and replenish food. It's about being able to protect yourself continuously, being able to power all of your needs, make sure you can make life easier by getting water out of the ground and heat into the house and air conditioning into the house, especially if you live in the South. All of these things, as well as communications, community, so much goes into emergency preparedness. And so I'll be bringing out more videos about that as well and focusing on those 12 pillars of emergency preparedness. If you found this helpful, smash that like button. If you are interested in any of those things that I mentioned, there'll be coupon codes and links and everything down in the description below. I appreciate you for watching. Be prepared. I'll see you guys in the next video.